Okay, good afternoon. My name is Steve Sonnenberg. I work for HDS Hitachi Data Systems, which is a subsidiary of Hitachi Limited. And I wanted to take this opportunity to update you on our activities uh, and plans with respect to OpenStack. So uh, Hitachi has uh, joined the party, perhaps a little later than others, uh, but in full force. Uh, most recently, we were uh, selected and approved to be uh, gold members of the OpenStack Foundation. Um, there's a couple of different areas where Hitachi uh, contributes. Uh, the first is Hitachi is a storage vendor, vendor and they make uh, enterprise storage, which means storage which is reliable, uh, storage of ultra performance, and other capabilities. And our goal is to bring those capabilities to OpenStack um, and to those uh, OpenStack adopters. So most recently, we have uh, introduced a Cinder driver for our mid-range. That's HUS or AMS, which is our unified storage. Um, we call it mid-range SAN. And that supports uh, iSCSI attachment for virtual machines. In the uh, upcoming release in the ICE House timeframe, we will also introduce uh, support for HNAS, which is our filer technology we've acquired from uh, Blue Arc, both for iSCSI and NFS. Uh, we'll be supporting fiber channel on our, our mid range and also fiber channel attachment to our enterprise, which is the, uh, the VSP and the HUS VM. Uh, all those can be seen in our, in our demo booth. What I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through some screenshots just for the sake of time, give you a quick idea of what it looks like and how they work. So uh, first of all, um, a, a Cinder driver is basically responsible for the provisioning, provisioning of the storage. Um, once the storage is provisioned, it's normally accessed through the VM or in some special cases uh, through what they call the brick layer in order to do backups and other operations. So in this uh, picture here, you see that we have three different classes of storage, enterprise, mid-range, and NAS, and those are accessed using fiber channel, iSCSI, uh, or NFS. And the Cinder role is really one of, the, one of control of uh, managing the provisioning task. In addition to that, I'm going to show you some of the uh, work that's been done um, in our, uh, one of the Japan development centers. It's a, a portal. And we will also, at the end, uh, discuss uh, the uh, HCP, which is our object store, our content, content platform, uh, which works uh, underneath Swift. So in, in order to demonstrate multiple multiple types of storage, uh, we use what they call multi-backend configuration. And uh, through volume typing, we, we can designate that for a given volume, when I want to create it, I want it targeted at a specific backend. So we can create storage that will uh, talk to the MS via fiber channel or HUS or, or NAS and so forth. And with those volumes, you can uh, perform any of the Cinder supported operations. You can attach them to uh, virtual machines, so you can, you can have your pick of storage uh, for where it's most appropriate. In addition to that, we can, uh, we can do operations such as uh, backup, uh, backup virtual machines. These are, these are standard, uh, standard operations that Cinder supports. So what is the advantage to the customers? Well, the customer now has a wide range of storage options not just the uh, commodity storage, but uh, enterprise storage, which differentiates itself in a number of ways. I don't actually work for a sales group, um, so I'm not going to go through the different capabilities that our, uh, our storage, uh, storage systems provide. Um, but the, the, the list is long and comprehensive, and by matching those to the appropriate workloads, um, you have the ability to build enterprise class OpenStack uh, configurations. So one typical use case, you can take uh, a company that's using OpenStack for DevOps, and in this uh, situation, 
Basically, you have a number of developers that are working on the same golden image as their starting point. They're working uh, collaboratively. Each one has their own virtual environment. Um, and along with that virtual environment comes uh, an application volume, maybe a database, and so forth. Uh, each of those requires basically a same starting point, but they can't afford to run storage for every a copy of storage for each one of them. If you multiply that by 100 you, or by 1,000, you end up with uh, uh, an awful lot of storage to manage. So um, Cinder supports cloning, and uh, our cloning can take advantage of our array-based cloning, uh, hardware uh, copy and write, copy after write, and do deduplication technology, which can take a lot of storage, a lot of virtual storage, and you end up paying very little for it. As an example, we can take uh, 30, 100 gig volumes, that's about three terabytes of storage, and we can uh, shrink that. So in a, in a four, terabyte, four terabyte file system with deduplication running, um, you can manage that in less than 200 gigabytes. So the clone takes no storage because it's using uh, copy and write. And even once the, uh, the copies start to diverge as development uh, moves along its cycle, um, the deduplication squeezes that down. So it's, it's very efficient and effective. So next I'll turn our attention away from the volume and the storage side into some of the portal activities. Um, the development group in Japan put together a portal as a proof of concept for one of their customers. Um, it's very similar to the uh, Horizon portal in, in functionality, uh, except that in two areas they added some additional capabilities. One of them is uh, what we call complex image or template management. Um, if you're familiar with VMware, this, this should, be, uh, um, should make a lot of sense, but if you think about what's involved in running an image, it's not just the image, but you have other volumes that make up the environment that you need to operate uh, at the same time. In addition to that, they put together uh, uh, more detailed task management so you can monitor the activity of operations. So in a typical VM environment, you have the OS image, which is managed by the hypervisor, um, but you also have other volumes, the application environment. And um, if you're using Horizon that comes out of the box, uh, you have to treat those two sets of image versus volume uh, separately. So if you want to do a backup, you have to back up the, the, the image, then you have to back up the volumes, and in order to back up an attached volume, you have to detach, and then back it up, then take a snapshot, back it up, and perhaps reattach it. So these aren't complex operations, but they weren't supported out of the box, and um, using our portal, we're able to manage uh, snapshots, backup, launching, and management of a, of a complex VM. So you can take a, a VM like the one in the center here that has attached volumes, and then using, using the, uh, the portal, you could create a machine snapshot which will snapshot the image plus the volumes, or you could back up the whole system and obviously restore it and reverse the process. Um, building a template is as simple as selecting the machine and then adding the storage that becomes part of the environment. And now when I go ahead and I launch the machine, I have a machine that's running with all of the uh, requisite volumes. So it simplifies, it simplifies management. Um, and then the last area I'll talk about is the uh, object server. One of the core components is Swift. Um, Long before there was Swift, uh, the Hitachi Data Systems had a product called Hitachi Content Platform, or HCP. Um, it's an object store, archive, repository. And what we've done in this case is put together a gateway that allows any of the Swift object servers to leverage HCP as the object repository. Um, why would you do that? Well, this. Uh, HCP platform is a uh, it's in the sixth generation, and it has a, an awful lot of capabilities. It's a very mature product, um, and we want to sell it to you. 
So if you, if you take a look at a, a typical Swift environment, you have your clients up on the top, including OpenStack itself, and then you have proxy nodes and storage nodes, and depending on how, how uh, large it's going to grow, you break that up into zones, et cetera, for, et cetera. With our, our gateway, the object server has actually become a, uh, almost a, a shim, and it doesn't store or manage server uh, storage locally, but instead it uses S3 to store that service externally, and since uh, HTTP can support uh, S3, we can provide uh, our archive behind, um, behind a Swift interface in a, in a very clean way. So our archive, for example, you can, with four nodes, you could build a basic cluster and manage up to four petabytes of storage with four servers. Uh, this can grow by adding additional nodes and you can uh, manage up to 80 petabytes with no size restrictions and a host of other features as well, backed, backed by uh, the re reliability and manageability of the uh, Hitachi storage family. So there are a lot of features inside of HCP. I can't sell it to you this afternoon. Um, one of the ones I did want to show you, though, is that it has a built-in query engine, which is based on Hadoop. And that becomes useful because most, most object stores are pools of storage, but it's a lot harder to figure out what it is that's in your pool once it's located in there. Uh, in order to do that, I want to introduce you quickly to what's inside an object store. So at the, at the logical level, uh, you have obviously objects. An object really is a blob with some metadata. It might have a naming system. Um, when you go to actually manage it physically, then you have a lot of file systems which themselves don't scale that well. You tie the file system together on many nodes and you store the attributes perhaps in uh, XFS, then you, you have an object store. So HTTP is, is, is a little different, but in principle, it provides the same, the same uh, com components. So if we take a look at Horizon and uh, inside of Swift, we'll see there, there are containers. Those are logical sub areas, if you will, of, of objects. And we've defined two as an example here, one for volume backups and one that I'll use for demonstration. And by highlighting volume backups, you'll see there's a set of objects and each of those objects actually uh, may have a compound name and uh, the backup will split the object into segments because there's a size limitation. And if you take a look at any object, you'll find there's metadata that describes it to the system. So here's an example of the object details on a single file. And inside that object repository, you may have blobs, but you can also store metadata as an object um, in this case, down at the, uh, at the right here, you see the header for a backup. It's stored as a piece of XML as a Swift object, and associated with it is a set of metadata shown at the top, and that metadata is uh, transported in HTTP headers. So what you're looking at on the top here are the standard headers that accompany an object, a timestamp, and so forth. Inside of our content repository, we would define what we call a tenant, which has uh, obvious parallel to OpenStack tenants. And inside each tenant, we can manage namespaces, which are similar to containers. <coughs> and for a namespace, we have various properties. So we'll enable, enable searching. Um, and inside the namespace, if we were to browse down, you'd see up at the top in the, uh, the gold, the orange print, uh, a, a true hierarchy of names because HTTP looks like a global file system. And inside a given object, there is two kinds of data. There's system metadata, which is stored for every object, and there's custom metadata. And to support S3, what we've done is we've created additional metadata or custom metadata to manage the S3 headers that, not, that aren't part of our core, our core infrastructure. So as a little demonstration here, what I'm gonna quickly do 
is I used Cloudberry and I've added a header. In this case, a very uh, original name, I call it MetaFoo and I'm going to store the value of var and I'm going to attach it to an object and you'll see that it ends up in our custom metadata. There's a foo and a bar and that may not seem very useful but uh, when you pair it to our, our search engine and, and realize that you can search for anything by content or by, by metadata, we can build complex searches using uh, Let's, in this case, an S3 Swift profile that allows us to look at the metadata and do queries and locate objects um, uh, extremely quickly. So this is just an example of how we can tie our content platform with its built-in search capabilities and, uh, and using Swift. And I thank you. Enjoy the rest of your show.